morning. I'm uh, Anita Bromberg, co-chair of this um, uh, annual event, and I'm very pleased to take this opportunity to, uh, to uh, welcome um, the, uh, all, um, all those that have registered. Many of you have uh, returned for uh, year after year for these events, knowing how uh, informative and interactive and I'm sure uh, today will be not disappoint you. It's my pleasure now uh, to call um, the co-chair uh, co and key organizer of these events, uh, Mr. Charles Wagner, um, a specialist non-par in estates and trust litigation. Um, his practice, of course, is both estate and commercial litigation through his boutique law firm of, Charles, of uh, Wagner Sidlovsky. And as chair, running chair of our state and trust groups and lawyers division, I'm sure you'll um, uh, join me in thanking him for all the effort that he's put in uh, to uh, organizing this event this morning. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Charles Wagner. Right in front of you. There he is. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the eighth annual CLE seminar run by B'nai B'rith. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying thank you. I want to thank our presenters for all their hard work today. I'd like to thank the Bank of Nova Scotia Trust Company who graciously has agreed to sponsor this year's seminar and especially John Clegg. I'd like to thank B'nai B'rith. I'd like to thank Hall and Hall and Ian Hall who has also agreed to sponsor and also Kimberly Whaley of Whaley Estate Litigation has also agreed to sponsor this year. I'd also like to make a point to thank quickly my co-chair, Anita Bromberg. She is wonderful. She is really one of the main reasons we're able to do an event in such a nice place and in such a nice way. I'd also like to thank Catherine Tan of my office who is the event coordinator for today. And of course, Frank Diamond. Frank, are you here? Good. Frank is at the uh, table getting some breakfast. But I'd like to thank him especially uh, because it's, uh, it's, it was very unusual when I started this idea many, many years ago to have somebody who said, sure, take the ball and run with it, which is exactly what Frank does. Does everybody have a binder? If you open up the inside of the binder, you'll see a, a lawyer in their robes, in his robes, that lawyer looks a lot like my partner, Greg Sidlovsky. That's not a coincidence. It's a flash drive. It has all the material for the event on it today. I want to make a, a point as well to thank uh, uh, Natanel and Hill Lichtenstein. As you can see at the back, they have uh, also assisted today and they, uh, if you go by during the break and put your business card in uh, the glass bowl over there, they will have a prize at the end for any one of the presenters. And just in a very summary fashion to start things out, I'd like to review the, uh, the facts upon which today's presentation is based. And I'm not going to go into it in, in much detail at all because that's going to be the job of uh, the panelists. But essentially, this is a case that's uh, frighteningly familiar to those of us in the profession that deals with these sorts of things. Uh, Mr. Rizzuli went into the hospital for surgery. It did not work out. And he came about uh, in a primitive vegetative state. The doctors did not feel that Mr. Rizzuli uh, should be on the ventilator. His wife disagreed. Ordinarily, as uh, one of the panel discussions will describe, uh, it, the substitute decision maker is the one who will make, uh, will make the call based on the instructions received from the patient when he was capable. If there's a disagreement or if the the instructions aren't clear, then the best interests of the patient should be governed. 
When the doctor and the patient agree, it's referred to the consent capacity board, and then either side can appeal the matter to the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. In this instance, that's not what happened. Uh, the doctors felt that they had a right to, when, when treatment wasn't medically warranted, not to provide it. And that's where we went to court. The three panel discussions are very exciting to me today because I think they really hit three key points that flow from this case. I'm, in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to introduce all the uh, uh, moderators of each discussion when they come up. I'm going to take a few minutes to do it now. First of all, I'd like to start with Ian Hall. Uh, Ian, as many people know, is a founding partner of Hall & Hall. He's a certified specialist in estates and trusts, and uh, he is really one of the deans of the industry. For those young lawyers in the audience, you should know that uh, all the panelists today are very nice, kind people. If you have a problem, uh, we all take time to speak to you when you call. We're, we, we remember when we were younger, unless we forget. Uh, Ian's panel is going to analyze the role of administrative tribunals and courts in these decisions. And he will also be giving a short intro to each of the panelists. Jordi Ayton is the founder of IWE. That is not from the Hamilton Tigats Oscar Wee Wee fashion. It is a educational program which is quite helpful. He's a certified specialist of states and trust law. He's also an adjunct professor at Osgoode Hall. His panel will address the question of what role money plays in this decision-making process or what role it should play in this discussion-making process. Deb Stevens, she is chairing the first panel. She's a partner at Goddard, Gamagay and Stevens. She, the, her firm specializes in estates and trust matters and guardianship. She's also been the children's lawyer for the province of Ontario. Deb is right on my left here. And without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton on to you. And I want to again thank uh, everybody for attending here today. Thank you, Charles. Um, I'm honored to be here. I've <clears throat> had the opportunity to be here for the last uh, three or four years. And uh, Charles and Anita always do a wonderful job of organizing these events and presenting topics that are really of a broad interest, not only to the legal profession, but also to the public at large. And today is no exception to that. Um, the Rizzuli case that we are going to talk about today, or at least I'm going to talk about less, but the panelists uh, are going to speak about more, um, is a fascinating case. It's intriguing, it's controversial, it blends medical and personal issues and legal issues in a way that uh, most of us still have difficulty trying to uh, perhaps not understand, but try and deal with uh, on an ongoing basis. The one thing that perhaps has come out of the Rizzoli decision that is, uh, well, the best thing that's come out of the Rizzoli decision, I think, is the discussion. The discussion not only within the medical community and healthcare community about how to deal with individuals who are facing end-of-life decisions uh, with their families or loved ones, but also the dialogue that should be going on with uh, every member of the public to ensure that their personal uh, decisions or their personal preferences regarding um, wishes at the end of life, whether it's from a philosophical, religious, or strictly a personal um, uh, view based on experience, those should not simply be put in the back of your mind and left. They should be communicated, communicated not only to your family and loved ones, but communicated in writing. We have legislation which allows us to do that. Uh, Ontario was one of the first to provide for that option. 
and it is very underutilized. Um, I was at a, a conference a while ago and we talked about um, many of us who draw wills, prepare wills, uh, who also do pow uh, powers of attorney. And of course there's a power of attorney for personal care which does allow you to make your wishes uh, regarding end of life decisions known. And there was a comment that we all too often do wills and then do powers of attorney as kind of a, oh yeah, do you want fries with that concept? which I thought was a perfect description for the way a lot of powers of attorney are done these days. They don't, uh, sorry, we don't often have that deep discussion <coughs> about what we really want. It tends to be quite boilerplate and uh, I think as Kim has referred to in her paper, it can have very, very uh, adverse consequences if we don't have real discussions as counsel with our clients about what they really want at the end of life. So there's my little diatribe. I do believe in some ways powers of attorney are more important than wills. Wills are, will, wills are wealth transfer that's going to happen after we're gone. But powers of attorney govern while we're alive. And quite frankly, I want to know what's going to happen to me and who's going to do it and when and why um, to the extent that I can. So I think powers of attorney are as important, if not more important, than wills. Um, I know that Charles uh, did uh, go through the facts very briefly, but I'm going to do a little bit more and then introduce the panelists, um, all of whom uh, are really quite special in terms of this case. Uh, Harry Underwood, uh, beside me, uh, acted for the doctors involved in the case. Um, Gary Hodder has acted for the Rizzuli family from the beginning. And Kim, uh, as many of you who've been here before, or you're very familiar with Kim, she is a specialist in estates and trusts, writes extensively in the area, and is a litigator in this area as well. The Rizzoli case involves two pieces of Ontario legislation, the Health Care Consent Act and the Substitute Decisions Act. And the decisions of three courts, our Superior Court, the Court of Appeal, and of course the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, went through that legislation and interpreted it and as again I will leave the panelists to give you the interpretations but it's really a fascinating examination of how statute sometimes drives uh, issues which we think are very personal. Mr. Rizzuli, Hassan Rizzuli, was 60 years old when he uh, had an operation for a benign brain tumor. He was a retired mechanical engineer uh, and he and his family had moved here from Iran. His wife was a physician, uh, Dr. Salasal, and uh, he, she uh, was in essence his substitute, not in essence, she was his substitute decision maker as his spouse. Mr. Rizzuli did not have a power of attorney for personal care. He was, when he went into hospital, otherwise healthy. He could communicate, he could move and do on his own, uh, but unfortunately uh, he got bacterial meningitis and became unconscious. Uh, he was diagnosed as having persistent vegetative state, uh, which I anticipate that one of the panelists will go into in detail but from a medical perspective it uh, results in, as I said, no consciousness, no appreciation uh, of what is going on in your surroundings. Uh, you may have involuntary movements, but from a medical perspective they are not deemed to be uh, conscious intended movements. Uh, the medical community, the doctors treating him, wanted to remove life support. Um, Mr. Rizzuli was on a mechanical ve ventilator. He was also being fed and hydrated through tubes. And it was their position that the continuation of the mechanical ventilator was of no medical benefit to him and as physicians uh, felt it appropriate to withdraw that treatment uh, based upon their obligations as physicians. Uh, Mrs. Sorry, Mrs. Sorry, Dr. Salasal, uh, as his substitute decision maker, because of course Mr. Rizzoli was not capable of providing consent um, or refusing, uh, determined that that was not what she wanted and would not have been what her husband had wanted. 
and she refused to consent to the withdrawal of the man mechanical ventilator. Um, the matter then went before the Ontario Superior Court of Justice on Dr. Salasal's application because she wanted an injunction to prevent the physicians from removing the life support. Uh, Justice Himmel, who heard the matter in first instance, uh, determined that the withdrawal of the life support constituted medical treatment and therefore could not be done without the consent of the substitute decision maker. That was then appealed to the Court of Appeal by the physicians uh, with the same result that with perhaps I'll, I'll say a bit of a twist on it, uh, I've read the Court of Appeal decision. Uh, as a lawyer, it's a very difficult one to read. Um, it's very involved. It perhaps leaves a few gaps. Uh, but again, I'll let this panelist speak to that. When the Court of Appeal also uh, declined to allow Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Rizzoli to be removed from life support, uh, the physicians then appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada. And in each instance, uh, and again, this story, the Supreme Court of Canada again refused the appeal. In each instance, the court determined that the withdrawal of life support was medical treatment, which required consent under the Substitute Decisions Act and the Health Care Consent Act, and that if the physicians uh, and the substitute decision maker had a disagreement about the standard of treatment, or not the standard of treatment, about the refusal or consent, then the legislature said, sorry, the legislation said that the process was then to go to the Consent and Capacity Board, uh, which is a board made up of lawyers, physicians, uh, maybe one layperson, um, which makes decisions based upon the uh, incapable person's wishes, if they are known, or perhaps what is in the best interests of the individuals. So that's a very broad overview of um, the facts of the case. I understand uh, from uh, Gary and Harry that uh, Mr. Rizzuli is still on life support. Uh, he is still at Sunnybrook Hospital. Interestingly enough, sometime I believe in or around late 2011 or early 2012, uh, there was a new no diagnosis of Mr. Rizzoli. He went from PVS, persistent vegetative state, to a minimally conscious state, um, which the family uh, had felt that there was um, uh, some improvement in his um, condition that he was responding to them. So again, it's, it's as I understand, there's not been any change from that diagnosis. But I will let um, both counsel uh, go into not only perhaps a bit more of the factual basis, but also certainly the uh, legal decisions themselves. Uh, I would first like to introduce Gary. Gary uh, has an interesting background, which I did not know. I didn't meet either of these two gentlemen before today, but I have heard lots about them. Uh, Gary started uh, his career as a journalist. Um, why he left to go to the dark side of law, I'm not quite sure, um, but we're very happy that he did so. Uh, he has, as I said, been uh, counsel for the Rizzuli family from the beginning. Uh, Gary has degrees from the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Toronto, and Harvard University. He is uh, a litigator, uh, primarily a civil litigator, and he has been involved in a number of uh, very interesting high-profile decisions. And I will now ask Gary to speak to you about the Rizzulis, uh, sorry, the Rizzuli family and uh, his role as counsel for them. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for that introduction. I am. Um, um, I, I never tire of um, talking about the Rasuli case um, because it has so many different facets, and it's been such an extraordinary journey for me and my law firm. And uh, my client, of course, was successful in in the Superior Court, successful in the Court of Appeal, successful again in the Supreme Court of Canada. 
Um, yet I can tell you that for, for me, certainly, this has been one of the most frustrating cases uh, that I've, I've ever had. And in part, it's because um, my, my personal feeling about this, and, it's, and it's, it's a very emotional case in dealing with a family in these circumstances, has a, an emotional overlay, it's, it's, which is unavoidable. But my in, in, sort of instinctive uh, um, uh, uh, approach to this issue um, is, is one that I could never argue. It's one that I could never, because it, 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 it would never have uh, had any traction in the courts, and, and specifically this. Uh, first of all, um, uh, at, a, at a philosophical level, um, I have a, a, a kind of a black and white view about deliberately ending someone's life. That is to say, um, I really have great difficulty distinguishing between withdrawing life support and a deliberate killing. Well, that, that was never going to get me anywhere in the courts because that's, that distinction is firmly and clearly accepted in, in Canadian law, and so I could never, I could never say anything um, uh, to that effect. Um, and then the second thing that I could never say, because it would never have any traction, is that um, I, while I accept that there are circumstances in which uh, life support may be withdrawn or should be withdrawn, um, I feel very strongly that this is not fundamentally a medical issue. This is not, I mean, the, the doctors may conclude what they will. Uh, at the end of it all, there's a different uh, uh, set of uh, considerations that really should apply in making that decision, um, which for me is fairly well recorded in uh, the Health Care Consent Act in terms of um, uh, what sorts of things the consent and capacity board should consider uh, when they're deciding whether or not to order a substitute decision maker to give consent. But in any event, um, I felt very strongly about that. But I, um, reading the case law, and and uh, uh, and, and, and this was this was a um, a novel journey for me because uh, I'm a commercial litigator, and I'll tell you in a moment how I got involved in this matter. Um, just reading the case law, it became apparent to me that uh, that this was only going to be won or lost um, uh, on the uh, on the playing field of medical decision making, and and that's not a field that I wanted to argue this on. Um, and then the third reason I felt so frustrated about this case is that um, it was impossible to address what um, seemed to me to be the elephant in the room. And that is the cost of maintaining my client's life. That that is something that, 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 that loomed large. I, I kept trying to imagine what was the motivation of the doctors in taking the position, as they did, that they really did not need anybody's consent to withdraw life support. Well, I mean, you know, did they bear any personal animus against my client? I couldn't imagine that. Um, why, why would they say that? Well. Uh, we know our health care system is overburdened. Did they need a bed? That made more sense. But early on in the piece, um, uh, uh, Harry uh, stipulated that, no, this was not a case about medical rationing. We were not going to be debating, um, you know, can we afford um, to maintain the Hassan Rasulis of the world who, whose family does not want to give consent to withdraw life, su life support and who is in uh, a, a situation of, of limited or no consciousness. But anyway, how all this came to me is that my, my computer consultant uh, said to me one day, look, um, you know, he's um, uh, is a member of the Iranian community and there's some people, recent arrivals of the Rasuli family, had an issue with their doctors at Sunnybrook and could I, you know, maybe help them out and make a phone call and so on. And um, next thing you know, I'm sending my associate to uh, family meetings up at, uh, at, at, at Sunnybrook, and I, I was very dismissive of it, actually. I said, no, this, the, you know, this, the law is well settled here. We have the, you know, I, I know just enough about this area of law to be dangerous, and, and uh, looked it up and, and read about it a bit. And I said, no, no, it's, it's pretty clear. Um, you, you need consent to withdraw life support, and if you don't have consent, there's the consent capacity board, and who would ever say anything different? And um, my, my associate, um, you know, started to tug my sleeve and say, you know, I, these, these doctors, he said, he, he had the sense that they were pretty serious in, in suggesting that they really didn't need consent. 
And then ultimately, in January 2011, Harry sent me a letter and made it all very clear, and he said that if we didn't get an immediate injunction of the Superior Court, then uh, his clients, the doctors, were going to withdraw life support and put an end to Hassan Rasuli. Well, uh, that, I mean, that, that, that to me, um, and, and, and again, with my black and white view of, of matters, um, I don't know where that came from, but with, with my black and white view of it, I, I, I felt that I had my first capital case as a lawyer. Um, that I was I was going to court to try to keep somebody alive, and 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 that's that's what it was, um, and um, and Justice Himmel uh, accepted my argument that the Health Care Consent Act uh, occupied the field and provided a mechanism of um, number one requiring consent and then permitting physicians to um, go to the consent capacity board and get uh, if, if if they didn't get the consent that they felt they should get from the substitute decision maker. And she took a many, many pages to say it, but essentially she said the act says what it says, which is what we, we said all along. But things got complicated um, when we went to the Court of Appeal on an expedited basis because the Court of Appeal um, listened very closely to Harry's argument, which is, um, and every time he made this argument I would wince because I, I I really didn't have any answer to it. I mean, what he kept saying over and over again was that, look, you can't compel doctors to um, continue treatment that they feel is medically futile. You just can't, you know, order them to do that. That's, that's it's, it's not something that makes any sense in the provision of, 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 of health care. And the, the, court, the Court of Appeal took that very much to heart, and, and they, they had to think of a way to get to where they wanted to go and, and still accommodate that argument. And so what we ended up with is the Court of Appeal saying, well, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not so much, uh, you know, withdrawal of treatment is not really treatment. And no, you can never, they said it very emphatically that you, you, you know you can't tell doctors, doctors to continue treatment. Ah, but guess what? If you're going to withdraw life support, that involves instituting palliative care. Palliative care is itself a treatment, and if you don't have consent to that, well, then that just solves the whole problem. Well, okay, great. That means that, you know, my client had won again, but I was scratching my head and thinking, you know, how, 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 does, how does that work? And, and um, quite predictably, we get the Supreme Court of Canada, and Harry makes, again, the unassailable argument that uh, why would we have a difference between somebody who, when you withdraw life support, gets palliative care, and somebody else who withdraws life support and dies instantly? Why, why would there be a, a different sort of consent required? And, if I, and I hope I've stated that fairly, Harry. Um, well, I hardly knew what to say. I mean, all I could do was just hang on to the, the statute for dear life. And, 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 and say to the court that, look, you know, this, this is, this, the, the mechanism works, let's not fool around with it and let's not get too, and, and of course the, uh, the Supreme Court picked up on the uh, uh, reasoning of the, of the Court of Appeal and, and expanded on it in a, in, a, in, a fairly, in a fairly major way to say that, look, um, you need consent for any kind of treatment which in, and, and palliative care itself is a touching, an invasion of one's personal space and you need, and you need consent for that. So um, here I've, I've, I've won all up and down the ladder, but none, none of, to my mind, none of the, the really important issues um, or the most important issues for me really, really got addressed. I mean, um, the, you know, Harry kept saying that, look, you know, there's no point in continuing medical benefit that's futile. And I thought, well, how is it futile? This is, this is, there's nothing futile about this treatment. It's keeping them alive. It's 100 percent effective. Um, more to the point, um, I felt that, that, um, that, that in terms of withdrawal of life support, I mean, is, you know, Harry kept arguing, with, well, look, it's not medical treatment if it's not doing any good or if it's futile or whatever. And I've, I felt, well, no, it's, it's, it's not medical treatment, but not for that reason. It's not medical treatment any more than providing, I mean, you know, if, if, if you're, you're giving somebody food and water, that keeps them alive. Well, you give them air, that keeps them alive. It's a sort of a provision of a necessity. It's not a really a medical treatment. We're not talking about, you know, discontinuing a, a, a regimen of, of, of drugs or, or physiotherapy or whatever. So, and anyway, these are, the, the, the issues I would like to have argued um, were, were 
were not part of this case, and I couldn't think of a way to make them uh, part of the case. And um, the, the, the I, I guess, I don't know, how am I doing for time? Okay. Oh, good, okay. Um, the, the, um, the, 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 the crux of the matter, I think, comes down to, and I was rereading um, Harry's factum in the Supreme Court uh, yesterday, and, um, and, and, and I just wrote down this sentence where Harry says, uh, whereas in Mr. Rasuli's case there is no reversible illness from which he can or will recover, life support serves no medical purpose. Well, you know, I, I, I mean, at, at a, at a, at a, on the medical side, that makes perfect sense. That's, that's, that's how physicians think. And it's true, and you can't argue it, and thank God we have these physicians. But, 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 there's, but there's so much more to it than that. I mean, you know, I, I, you know what, what, what seems to me is there, if there's no reversible illness from which he can or will recover, well, I mean, that's true of all of us. I mean, we're all dying of something eventually. I mean, there's, there's you know, <laughs> there's no, we're, 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 you know, we're, 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 we're all terminally ill in that sense. So how does, how does um, um, you, you know, life support serves no, no medical purpose? Well, may, maybe not, but this is where, to my mind, the, the, the question of the medical purpose must give way to, to other considerations, and uh, maybe by accident or maybe deliberately, I don't know, the, the Health Care Consent Act gives an alternative forum and, and, and provides factors such as uh, um, religious beliefs in, uh, in the instance of the Rasuli family. They are um, devout Muslims. They've been portrayed in the press as being fairly extreme in their views about one should never withdraw life support and so on, and that was never their view all along. They just, they just felt um, that in this particular instance that uh, Hassan Rasuli um, did have a degree of consciousness, which was um, in the early going uh, dismissed out of hand by the doctors. Um, but in between the um, Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada, there was a new diagnosis. And the new diagnosis was that Hassan Rasuli was not in a permanent vegetative state. He was in a minimally conscious state, which is uh, a step rather up from persistent vegetative state. And, uh, and the family felt vindicated. Because, and it's, it's so often the case, isn't it, that, that you know, family members, they, they, they know another family member better than any physician possibly could because they know what that person is like. Uh, my clients were adamant that they were in at least some degree of communication with Hassan. And uh, finally, there was, as I say, this new diagnosis that said that, that he fell into that narrow category of a uh, person diagnosed with PBS who was actually in a minimally conscious state with, not a big one, but at least some modest chance ultimately of recovery. When that occurred, I thought, well, I mean, this case is over now. I mean, the, the physicians would never, ever want to withdraw life support. Now, how, how could they possibly want to withdraw life support given that he is uh, in a minimally conscious state? And, and, and I, uh, I, I brought a motion to the Supreme Court of Canada to quash the appeal. I said, this is, this is, this is now moot. There's, there's no point in debating um, what's going to happen to Hassan now. The family has proven to be right. They're, um, he's in a minimally conscious state, and and in here I've written to the, the the doctors, lawyers, asking them to say, look, can you can you confirm that you now still want to withdraw life support that he's in a minimally conscious state? And they, would, they didn't do that, um, and so we brought a motion, a panel of five judges, the Supreme Court of Canada, and they, the Chief Justice of Canada looked at me and said, no, Mr. Hodder, this is an important case, and we want to hear it. Okay, fine, um, but. But the, 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 the reason that I tell you that is that, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's part of the analysis here that, you know, sometimes the physicians are wrong in their assessment of whether or not somebody is, um, is, is going to recover and what is the nature and quality of, of, their, uh, um, uh, of, their, of their state of consciousness. And, uh, and in this instance, uh, that state of consciousness was um, was was misdiagnosed, and and that's obviously um, uh, something something to um, uh, something to bear in mind. Um, I, I could rattle on, um, and, but I, I see my time is up, and I'll I'll yield the floor. Okay. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, 
as you can see, I think Gary's pretty passionate about the, the decision, and uh, uh, it's, it's important for uh, lawyers, I think, to recognize and, and the public recognize that there are people who will have differing views and will stand up for each and every perspective that is to go before the courts. The other perspective, of course, is that of the physicians involved. Uh, I think it was Dr. Cuthbertson and uh, Rubenfeld who went, uh, took the matter before the courts. Um, Harry Underwood uh, was formerly a partner with McCarthy Tetro. Uh, he's a commercial litigator, highly respected. Uh, he has uh, represented physicians uh, for many years and uh, was very familiar with the Consent and Capacity Board and on behalf of the physicians took this matter to, as you can see, the Supreme Court of Canada uh, based in part upon, uh, as Gary said, the concept that where there is no medical benefit to a treatment that the, um, that treatment should uh, be withheld if it's essentially futile. So Gary is uniquely, uh, as I said, suited, uh, was uniquely suited to represent the physicians in this case and uh, represented them well. Uh, obviously, it went all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, and they thought it was important to hear from Harry and the physicians, and I will let, you, sorry, let him uh, tell you what that experience entailed and what their position was. Well, Gary has set the terms of debate fairly and squarely, as he always does. Um, Certainly a, a pleasure to deal with such an upfront guy through the odyssey that we went through together, and, and, and sometimes um, we, uh, we, we shared our, 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 our private concerns over the whole thing, over the telephone, um, because it was, uh, it was quite a, an amazing odyssey to go through. It's my respectful suggestion to you that however they may have framed uh, the result, the, the courts have departed from two principles that are well established in the law. And Gary has told you that I um, referred to them constantly. The first is that patients have no right to treatment except as a doctor may offer it to them. And the second is that doctors have no duty to offer treatment that will not benefit the patient. And I think the courts uh, <clears throat> effectively decided against the application of these principles in, in this situation because they were determined that the Consent and Capacity Board was the place for these disputes to be resolved and they could only do that by making the matter uh, withdrawal of life support one of informed consent. Before Rizzuli, end of life cases would sometimes come before the courts um, and sometimes before the board. And if before the courts, the dispute uh, generally concerned whether the doctor should be ordered to provide treatment by the courts, such as, for example, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation in the case of a patient who could arrest. Or they might be asked, the courts might be asked to order uh, the doctors to continue to provide treatment that the doctors wish to withdraw. These cases often arose on injunction applications like the one we had in this case, and, and the courts had gone both ways, essentially there was no certainty. And sometimes the doctors just chose to treat the matter as one involving informed consent and to take it to the board and to uh, quarrel over with the, uh, with the substitute decision maker to dispute what the patient would have wished in the circumstances. So three levels of the courts have now found that the dispute between the Rizzuli family and the doctors uh, in the ICU as to whether life support should continue is to be resolved by the board, not by the courts that the doctors had sought. So the question naturally arises, uh, well, why didn't the doctors take it to the board in the first place? Why insist that it go before the courts? One possible answer is that they had an idiot for a lawyer. I don't, I don't believe that's the correct answer. Um, <laughs> And unmeritorious physicians don't, don't often make their way up to the Supreme Court um, or indeed find favor with a minority of the judges there, as ours did. Uh, the answer from the doctor's point of view, this question, why didn't you do that, is found in the dissenting reasons of the minority in the Supreme Court. And that was that the board lacked the jurisdiction to determine the real matter and issue, um, and that only the courts have that jurisdiction. 
And why is that? That's because, as you'll be hearing more today, I'm sure, the board has a limited role to play under the statute that, that creates it, the Health Care Consent Act. The board can only determine disputes about whether a substitute decision maker has properly given or withheld consent on behalf of an in, incapable person's uh, behalf to treatment that a doctor offers. And that's a question that's to be determined, of course, by the patient's wishes if she or she, he or she had previously expressed them. In this case, uh, however, the treatment, life support, was no longer on offer. And that was because the doctors concluded it couldn't continue to benefit Mr. Rizzulli, who'd fallen into a state of permanent unconsciousness, or if you want to call it a minimally conscious state, the very next thing to it, uh, due to the destruction by infection of, of large parts of his cerebral cortex. And the board simply has no power to order a doctor to offer or to provide treatment. And the courts, on the other hand, uh, do have that power. They have the power to review medical decisions um, and to order a doctor if, to, to offer medical treatment if, uh, if it's capable of benefiting a patient. So at this point, uh, please note two things that the doctors weren't asserting. First of all, they weren't asserting that they had the discretion to withdraw care. Um, to the contrary, they could only withdraw care in accordance with the medical standard of care. And therefore, they could only withdraw the care if it could no longer benefit the patient. And secondly, they weren't asserting that the decision was unreviewable. To the contrary, the doctors said that uh, cases of proposed withdrawal um, leading to uh, certain death probably should always come before the courts for sanction. Now, what, what about this term benefit? And if, if, if Gary had uh, a, a matter that, that he fretted over, this was one I fretted over. Because uh, while benefit is, is a crucial concept in medical decision making, um, it could be argued that it, it's rather subjective. It could be claimed that by someone that in his or her own eyes it, was a bene it is a benefit simply to being kept alive even if they're incapable of experiencing the fact that they are alive. So medicine does operate, has to operate with a concept of benefit that uh, is objective. Um, and it, it's de determined by what the purposes of medicine are, which are the same things as what medicine can accomplish. Uh, the purpose of medicine is, of course, to cure illness, and if it can't do that, to stabilize symptoms, to keep the patient in a state of relative well-being um, so that the patient can continue, at least to a degree, to enjoy life. And life support uh, has a more specific purpose still, and that is to keep a patient alive pending an anticipated or hoped for recovery from uh, a life-threatening condition. And all this, I suggest, the medical understanding of what a benefit is accords with ordinary common sense. For how, how many of us would think that it should be a purpose of medicine uh, in general or life support in particular to keep people alive indefinitely just because medicine can do that and just because uh, someone might wish it? without there being any benefit in the ordinary sense associated with that. So to recap, the doctors asserted that they had no duty to continue life support in this hopeless case, and in fact a duty not to do so. So no treatment was offered and no right to give or withhold consent arose. Informed consent has often always been seen in the law as uh, a right to refuse offered treatment, not to compel treatment ever, but only to refuse treatment which a physician is prepared to provide. And of course, a patient is entitled to refuse treatment for any reason and not, or none at all. So it's a, it's a, it's a shield against unwanted uh, invasion of one's person. It's not a sword. As an English court put it, um, it's a key. It's merely a key that unlocks a door to medical treatment. And the Health Care Consent Act, we argued all along, merely codified these very well-recognized principles of law. There wasn't any indication in the Act that it intended to turn the concept of informed consent on its head so as to permit patients in certain circumstances to compel treatment by refusing to consent to its withdrawal. So 
how did the majority a approach this? Uh, one, one way of approaching it, and I, I thought the way that they might approach it in order to um, find against the doctor's position was to find that the withdrawal of life support is, is ipso facto the withdrawal of a benefit. And therefore, uh, the doctors had a duty to continue to provide the treatment. But in fact, the majority gave no consideration whatever to the question of whether the continuation of life support in Mr. Rizzulli's case uh, could benefit him. And of course, if it had done so, my position is it would have, to, have had to conclude that he could uh, sustain no benefit from, um, from being ventilated uh, indefinitely. So the majority held in effect that the statute mandated a right to refuse withdrawal of treatment regardless of its lack of benefit um, or indeed of any efficacy whatever in the case of Mr. Rizzulli except keeping, keeping his, his heart beating, his, his uh, uh, blood oxygenated and his body nourished and that's the state he's in. So in order to come to this conclusion which overturns the common law uh, to convert the principle of informed consent into a sword and to compel doctors to provide uh, certain treatment regardless of whether it can provide a benefit, uh, you would think that the decision had to be uh, supported by clear statutory language. But it isn't. I would argue that the statute, the Health Care Consent Act, contains no language which supports the decision of the majority. Even those judges acknowledged that they were giving the statute what they called a nuanced reading. And I would argue that they read into the statute their view of what the law should be. All, as I've asserted, in order to ensure that these matters get heard by the Consent and Capacity Board and not by the courts. So, as Gary pointed out, uh, the majority held uh, that the withdrawal of life support is itself a form of treatment which has never been recognized by, uh, by the medical profession or previously by the courts. And it's for that reason that informed consent was required. And the statute did not compel that conclusion in my respectful view. And it found that basically for a couple of reasons, which Gary also alluded to. Uh, for one thing, it held that the withdrawal of life support involves a touching, um, and uh, therefore the patient's consent is required. And to this, I would respond that when a patient consents to treatment, the patient necessarily consents to all forms of touching associated with the treatment, um, including those involved in ceasing to provide the treatment. So think of it this way. If you're on the operating table and the anesthetist asks you for your consent to undergo the anesthetic, if the anesthetist should say to you, and I need your consent to turn off the oxygen and remove the mask when you're waking up, I think you'd think the, the anesthetist was a bit of a flake. The second reason um, the court gave for uh, finding that in this case the withdrawal of treatment is treatment is that the doctors proposed to provide palliative care in place of life support and palliative care undoubtedly is treatment and undoubtedly requires consent. But the withdrawal of any form of treatment and the commencement of another one are quite separate medical acts. They're done for separate indications. And a patient can't compel treatment to continue. We all recognize this simply by uh, refusing a proposed substitution. So a cancer patient, for example, can't require a doctor to continue providing chemotherapy when the doctor wants to substitute radiotherapy by saying, no, I won't consent to the radiotherapy, therefore you have to consider you have to continue providing the chemo. It just doesn't make sense. So while the court was clearly of the view that, that this was not a, a matter for, uh, for doctors to decide pursuant to the medical standard of care, they did create a very, very narrow uh, exception. Um, and you'll perhaps hear more about this in the discussion as the day goes on. Um, it's, it's almost a, a, an exception that's tailored to Mr. Rizzulli's circumstances themselves. Uh, there, there has to be uh, a proposed withdrawal of life support. In other words, the patient will certainly die um, if, uh, if the, the treatment is, is discontinued and it, 
there has to be an offer of palliative care or palliative care has to be provided in association with this withdrawal. Um, and and the, the aspect of the touching is important and that by itself makes it clear that the court wasn't saying that a withholding of treatment, which involves no touching, uh, itself can require consent under any circumstances. So what, why does this uh, exception exist? Um, the, the courts at, at various levels have justified this. They've said that it's compelled by the statute, and I've tried to show you that it isn't. But they, they've, uh, they've said that it's, it's also a matter of patient autonomy. Um, and, and I question that because that same value, patient autonomy, would justify requiring consent to any withdrawal or any withholding of medical care if applied, you know, in the sense that it's being applied here. The fact is that patient autonomy and patient wishes have their limits. Um, you can't just insist that a doctor provide treatment because you desire it or continue treatment because you desire it. And as the Court of Appeal pointed out, with unintended irony, in, in all cases, in all such cases, um, the, the patient is protected by the doctor's obligation to comply with the standard of care. That is, to, to offer treatment where it can benefit the patient. Doctors do have that obligation. So why do I say unintended irony? Well, because the court's observation applies equally to the withdrawal of life support. Um, the, the patient is protected by the doctor's obligation to continue life support if that can benefit the patient in the sense that I've described. So the court didn't explain why the concept of patient autonomy itself demanded an exception to the general rule. So why I was going over with uh, my, my talk with my son who's just graduated from law school and, and he said to me at the end, well that's all very well but why, why should we care? And, and that, why should we care that the, that the court has uh, intervened in this way and, and required uh, the continuation of life support? Um, after all, a life was preserved as a result. And there are two reasons I suggest why we should all care about this. Uh, one is a moral reason and the other is a practical reason. First, the moral reason. Um, doctors tend to the view that, yeah, that if a treatment affords no benefit, then it causes the patient a detriment, um, even in respect of an unconscious person. Um, sustaining his life is, uh, is an infliction of life, I suggest, for we all of us generally believe that, that the dying have the right to a dignified death, uh, which encompasses the right to be allowed to die. Second, the practical reason. And that is that doctors, by uh, limiting treatment to those who can benef benefit from it, um, serve as gatekeepers to the medical system, ensuring that scarce resources are preserved for cases where, where they can do some actual good. It's not their job specifically to serve as gatekeepers, but by, by meeting out treatment only where treatment can do good, they serve that function. So. I'm concerned that this decision tells doctors, we don't want you to be guided by our, our moral conscience, and we don't want you to serve as gatekeepers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. Uh, it is a bit of a conundrum. We have this desire for patient autonomy, uh, personal decision making, a right to make decisions about how we end our lives or how medical treatment is provided to us. And as uh, Harry said, the teaching and education and faith that we have in our physicians that they do understand the appropriate treatment for individuals, uh, whether it's uh, end of life or otherwise. I, when you were talking, Harry, I thought about uh, a, f a person I know, I'll just say it that way, who went over on their ankle, was convinced it was broken, wanted an x-ray, wanted a... Uh, scan one MRI, but the physician treating would not provide it. Uh, I assume that's because the physician involved was quite convinced that it was not broken, and as I, I was ultimately right, uh, and I guess that's a bit of our concern about uh, resources and how they're used. Um, the, our last speaker on this panel is Kimberly Whaley. As I said, many of you may know her from prior programs uh, here. 
Uh, Kim is uh, the principal and founder of Whaley Estate Litigation, uh, which specializes in estates and trusts and guardianship law. Uh, Kim is a certified specialist in that area of practice. Uh, she has been an adjunct professor at, sorry, a professor, I should say, at Queen's University and the University of Toronto Law Schools. She uh, is a member of the Society of Estates and Trust Practitioners. Uh, she has authored many articles and a book on uh, estates and trust matters, and she is certainly a wonderful representative to talk about how the impact of the Rizzuli decision uh, will affect uh, estates and trust practitioners, uh, both with respect to how they deal with uh, their clients, perhaps, in dealing with powers of attorney, but also how the decision impacts the public at general. Kim? Thank you, Deb. Unfortunately, like my colleagues Harry and Gary, I have not um, been involved in the Rizzuli case. Uh, thankfully, I've only been asked to look at it from the outside looking in uh, on the impact and, and guidance that the rest of us can glean from this decision. With respect to the impact on doctors, the Supreme Court of Canada sent a clear message to physicians in Ontario faced with similar situations. That is, when an SDM, a substitute decision maker, refuses to provide consent to withholding, withdrawing treatment, the recourse to the physician is to permissively apply to the Consent and Capacity Board, if inclined, uh, to challenge a refusal. And the family in this case, and in any future case, now ought not to be put into the position of making a court application for injunctive relief, since, as our court said, it may heighten the vulnerability of incapable patients if the legal burden is on the family to initiate court proceedings, especially if the SDM lacks resources and the wherewithal to do so. This case does not create any new rights for SDMs to unilaterally demand interventions which have no medical benefit. Section 21.1 of the Health Care Consent Act outlines the guiding principles that are to be applied by any substitute decision maker, uh, whether under Section 20 of the cons Health Care Consent Act or uh, as an appointed attorney in giving and refusing consent. The SDM does not have carte blanche to give or refuse consent. The first applicable principle is where the SDM knows of a prior expressed wish by the patient applicable to the circumstances and the second is where there's no such wish, the SDM shall act in the incapable person's best interests. This decision does not change the procedure for resolving disputes in these circumstances, and this decision simply put provides a clear finding on how the existing statute should be interpreted and applied. So where do we go from here? While this decision does reflect the status quo on Ontario hospitals, the practical impact is such that hospitals and physicians ought to consider reviewing their policies to ensure clarity around the issues of refusal uh, and consent to treatment. These policies ought to be reviewed internally, including the available procedures to resolve disputes. Physicians should have appropriate resources available to them to properly inform themselves, and so too to commence an application to the CCB. Importantly, physicians should also be frank and open with patients about the importance of end-of-life decisions. A March 2012 Ipsos Reid poll found that less than half of all Canadians have had a discussion about end-of-life care wishes with their family members. Only 9% had ever spoken with their health care provider about the issue. The average Canadian may not be aware of the daily ins and outs of an intensive care unit, and this knowledge may in fact change a person's understanding and as such wishes regarding end-of-life treatments. As we know, Mr. Rizzuli did not have a power of attorney for personal care or an advance plan or directive before his surgery. He had no known discussion with the doctors about what it might look like afterwards if he found himself in the situation he ended up in. So the more open and frank the dialogue that exists between treating physicians and patients, as well as their SDMs, the better equipped each will be to make an informed decision. As developments in science and medicine continue to excel rapidly, it's critical to have these conversations. An understanding of the medical meaning of vague terms such as heroic measures and other interventions is crucial 
whether leaving verbal or written preferred wishes within any treatment protocol and within the obligatory standard of care of a physician. Treating physicians, especially critical care doctors, ought to be aware of the nuances in the identification of the correct substitute decision maker and to conduct discussions surrounding the patient's values and beliefs. Checklists and questionnaires should be developed and provided to physicians to assist with these discussions where available. While this case turned on the interpretation of legislation in Ontario and dealt with the Consent Capacity Board, which is unique to this province, the principles and obiter in this decision can be extended or notionally applied more widely to doctors. On policy, as Gary said, the many overlapping and competing public policy considerations uh, the court didn't speak to, made no determination one way or another. And that includes the implications of, for instance, scarce resources such as ICU beds, since these issues were not before the court and remain legislati legislative and pu public policy issues. <coughs> the impact on patients of comfort to patients uh, and Canadians is the recognition by the Supreme Court of Canada of the importance of the ethical principle of a patient's autonomy and that doctors cannot make unilateral decisions. Notably, Mr. Rizzuli did not express any knowing wishes regarding the removal of life support. The substitute decision maker in this case acted in refusing to consent on her understanding of Mr. Rizzuli's religious belief. This case, therefore, serves as an overall caution to Canadians of the extreme importance of turning one's mind to the end of life directions, decisions. If, any, if everyone could engage in some sort of advanced care planning while capable, similar litigation may be prevented in the future. Through the tools offered by advanced care planning, such as which can be provided by powers of attorney for personal care and other sorts of plans and directives, Patients or clients can attempt to ma maintain autonomy and dignity. Thoughtful, considered planning provides the patient with a degree of control without forcing loved ones to make very difficult decisions after the fact. It's also important to note that a patient's wishes will not be mechanically applied. An analysis must always take place. When the patient expressed a wish, was it a capable wish, keeping in mind there's a legal presumption of capacity, and was it intended to apply in the circumstances? Was there knowledge and approval of that wish? The communication of preferences is essential, including end-of-life wishes, values, and beliefs. The person one chooses to consent or refuse treatment while incapable must have clarity, especially concerning wishes surrounding life-sustaining measures, and particularly, as this case evidences, where treatment can be determined as having no medical benefit. This case is uh, one that uh, seriously causes one to ponder the importance of one's choice of substitute decision maker. The Supreme Court of Canada confirmed that an SDM must provide consent before life support will be withdrawn. If you don't wish to remain on life support, you must be in a position to trust your substitute decision maker will provide that consent when it comes time. An SDM must take into account the best interest as defined by the Healthcare Consent Act and the Substitute Decisions Act, which would include one's value and belief system as well as overall medical well-being. Drafting solicitors should also notably assess their ongoing practices and procedures, and that's particularly so in, in the aftermath of the case which uh, Deb briefly mentioned, that being Friedberg and Korn. When drafting solicitors are doing these planning documents for clients, they should be thorough in their discussions and in obtaining instructions regarding powers of attorney for personal care and advanced care plans, and also be cognizant of the limitations that a lawyer may have in this regard. A lawyer is not a doctor. A lawyer arguably should refer a client in considering advanced care planning to their medical doctor, an ethicist, or other health healthcare practitioner for assistance. Boilerplate language should be avoided, and end-of-life clauses should not simply be add-ons uh, to powers of attorney for personal care documents. And a good reference that I found for, for, for all the lawyers in the room uh, was a paper prepared by Dr. Gordon uh, from Baycrest, and he had some guidelines for lawyers in his paper, Who Can You Trust With Your Most Important End-of-Life Decisions? Lessons from the Ontario Court of Appeal. In your paper, I provided a link that 
paper appears on my website, and I think it uh, might currently be being published. So it's tried to say that those with particular religious beliefs ought to make those beliefs, customs, and related governing laws or documents evincing the nature and extent of such beliefs known to their treating medical professionals, their legal advisors, their friends, their family, and their potential substitute decision makers. Carefully constructed plans ought to be considered while having regard to several competing principles of law, of medicine, ethics, morality, and policy through the interplay of subjective and objective applications. To contemplate every circumstantial situation may prove completely impossible and impractical. Guidance in a power of attorney for personal care document, for example, should arguably not so limit the substitute decision maker's authority inadvertently by purporting to be providing a comprehensive list of wishes contemplating every eventuality. In the end, the attorney will have discretion only within the permissible confines of the governing legislation in place at the time and the document. In providing this commentary, I want to place great importance on the careful consideration of planning directives and whether or not the terms actually achieve the intended goal. The challenge is getting the balance right in terms of planning directives in that they're not so detailed so as to be inadvertently self-limiting and not so vague or unclear so as to fail to convey the actual wishes. Thankfully, I don't have the task of doing that as I'm not a drafting solicitor. While this case has arguably garnered a lot of attention and commentary, the bottom line is it did not change the law, it simply affirmed it. And however, um, however we look at it, one thing does uh, stay with us, and that is if we plan now, uh, it gives us incentive to prevent this sort of uh, emotional, expensive litigation in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, again, I'm, I'm very, uh, on your behalf, I'd like to thank uh, our panelists. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity to have the individuals who lived through the Odyssey, I think that's how you refer to it, Harry, uh, to be able to speak to all of you about their experience and to have Kim talk about how it affects the public in general and what we can do about it. Uh, it's perhaps a bit uh, complex, thought-provoking for an early Monday morning after a beautiful long weekend, um, but I'm sure all of you uh, appreciated their efforts. And we are going to open up the floor with these panelists now for a few questions, if you, uh, I assume that there's mics available. Thank you. Um, if no one has a question, I do. Um, and that is, uh, there's really two questions that came to mind listening to our panelists. And the third, I will wait with mine if you've got one first. Go ahead, please. Hello, yes. Uh, yeah, I've got a question. I don't know if any of you heard about this, but there was this, uh, this case out in BC uh, a couple of months ago, the Bentley versus Maplewood Seniors Care Society. It's, uh, it's kind of like the, the Rizzoli case in, in reverse, uh, as it were, where, um, where the, uh, the attorney under the power of attorney is, is trying to, uh, to with, withdraw care. This concerns a, a, a feeding tube where, where the, uh, the, the power of attorney for personal care, the equivalent in BC, uh, had specifically outlined that there there shouldn't be uh, a, a use of uh, of feeding tubes, and the um, the the long term care facility um, wanted to continue um, uh, use of, of the feeding tube, and uh, the the British Columbia Supreme Court, which is um, their equivalent to our Superior Court, um, they 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 decided uh, in in. In line with the with the long-term care facility, rather than uh, in line with, the, with with a substitute decision maker. So I don't know if any of this is similar to Ontario or any of this is relevant to Ontario, but um, but maybe uh, someone can can discuss uh, if if someone has in their in their in their power of attorney for personal care that they they don't want use of uh, of of a, of a feeding tube. Um, to, to what extent uh, can uh, can a long-term care facility override that? Um, to what, what what would the law be in in, in Ontario in this sort of situation? 
Well, I, I will let one of the panelists handle that, but I understand if I've got the correct case, it was a situation where uh, the woman involved was being fed uh, manually by the nursing home uh, staff, and the issue was the reflex when she opened her mouth to accept food, and in some circumstances, at least from the um, institution's perspective, if she did not want more food or if she did not like the particular food, she would keep her mouth closed. The family in that circumstance, as my understanding, wanted to withdraw uh, the provision of the feeding, the manual feeding to her, and that was refused ultimately. Uh, I think that's, Kim, uh, maybe that's, I believe, the facts I of the case. I did briefly look at that case just in the context of, of this. I think that's right. Um, and I, I've lost sight of what the actual question was. So. I think that the question was um, what, how that would play out in Ontario, perhaps, and whether the Rizzoli decision would have um, uh, a relationship to that. Uh, I think and, and that sorry just I think there was an issue as I recollect there's a different piece of legislation out in BC and I think the concern was whether she had the the incapable person had provided a sufficient directive or whether there was some confusion over her directive right wasn't there some question too about whether or not she had the ability to consent mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, and I I think at first instance, that's what I, anybody has to look at. Does the person have the, the ability to consent to eating or not eating? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then to the SDM as to, um, you know, what is, the, what is the decision that should be applied in the, in the circumstances? did have Alzheimer's. Now at the time that the, the power of attorney or personal care or the, the equivalent uh, w w was made, this person clearly had capacity, was in fact very sophisticated uh, in her understanding of, of, the, uh, of the, the, the consequences and have very specifically stated in the power of attorney for personal care or equivalent that, um, that she did not want, want use of a feeding tube. Uh, and yet um, the, the court found that, that that wasn't relevant because they said something to the effect that um, uh, a feeding tube is not, um, it's not um, medical care, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's just um, some sort of, sort of provision of nourishment that this isn't medical yeah. care, so it's not covered by uh, their equivalent of a power of attorney for personal care. So I don't know uh, how that plays out in, in Ontario, though. Sure. Deb, I, I actually think that somebody else is speaking about Bentley this morning. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I, I read it in one of, I think, maybe Professor Oosterhoff's paper. I'm not sure. He's not here right now. So um, I, if it's going to be dealt with later, unless you want no. to say something here. Sorry, next question, please. So, Mr. Hodder, I apologize. I haven't really had a chance to read the Rizzoli case through and analyze it. Um, one of the points that I wasn't clear on his wife was the decision maker in this case, correct? Correct. And was she appointed by a personal care power of attorney, or how, how did she become the decision maker? Uh, by operation of the statute. Oh, so she, so she didn't even actually have a, a personal care power of attorney. And, and um, I, I'm reading some of the other cases, and the courts seem to be focusing on whether or not the decision maker is making a decision based on the best interests of their patient, of their uh, uh, the person that they're caring for, and they seem to be focusing on the wording of the personal care power of attorney. But in this case, that issue wasn't uh, addressed by the courts. It doesn't seem, and then that seems to be one of the focuses of the courts in other cases, whether in fact this decision is being used, and, and then religious beliefs come into effect. So, how did that play out in this case? Uh, well. I as you say, quite correctly, there was no um, power of attorney for personal care. Um, a point that that, um, that Harry kept making over again with great force was uh, that the statute puts a big premium on prior capable wishes. And uh, Harry's point was, see if I get it right, uh, was, was that if, if you have somebody with a prior capable wish in Ontario who says, um, look, I want all possible life support to be maintained in place no matter what forever that that 
the physician doesn't can't even take that to the to to the uh, um, uh, to the consent and capacity board. Do I have that at all right, Harry? Absolutely. Yeah, and and uh, so, but the, but the, the the takeaway from that is um, to to prepare um, a a living will to prepare a document that records these wishes because. Um, subsequently, um, I, I don't know what happened in British Columbia on this other case, but um, certainly in Ontario, um, the way our law is set up, we put a big premium on them and there's not too much um, opportunity for anyone to wiggle around a prior capable wish. Okay, thank you. Ian, would you like to? Uh, yes, actually, just to follow up on that, that, that was sort of the question I was going to ask in it, but in a different way. I, I don't do litigation. I counsel people in estate planning uh, with their powers of attorney with their wills. Uh, do I take the, the, uh, the answer to the last question to be that if someone does a power of attorney for personal care and does it, and I, took a, I had a chance to look at Charles Wagner's sample there, and essentially has a, one that's loaded no matter what, and even if it doesn't have religious beliefs, let's just say it's my philosophy that uh, I want to be, remain alive no matter what, and puts that in a personal care attorney, that, and a, the client says, well, what if the doctors don't agree? Can they challenge this? Is the answer to that no? I, I, I view it as, it's not something that was central to our case, but right. Harry, maybe you could address that better. If the patient is receiving life support, the circumstances therefore are similar to the Rizzuli case, then the answer is the wishes bind. Okay. And just, um, and we have the benefit of Heinz. I said that if the circumstances are the same as in the Rizzuli case and the, the life support in particular has been instituted, then the wishes will bind. Okay. And, but if there is no power of attorney, then you're on the, the what is the medical, the benefit test, which is what the... There, well, there, there's now it being treated as a matter of informed consent, the, the, the statutory test would apply. Um, so you'd have to go to Section 21, as Kimberly said, of the, uh, of the Health Care Consent Act and parse the considerations that a substitute decision maker has to take into account um, where there are no preceding uh, capable wishes expressed, that have been expressed and are applicable to the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we will close the questioning and invite the next panel up through Charles. Uh, if that doesn't get you to sign a personal care power of attorney, I don't know what will. Thank you. Before we invite the next panel up, I wanted to uh, again say thank you and, and tell you that I view all the panelists we have today as champions. They are really all top tier professionals. And in trying to figure out what a token of appreciation would be appropriate, I thought I would take uh, counsel from a very dear friend of mine who is also a champion. He was such a winner that Ace Bailey, when he retired his number, gave it to this hockey player. He was a member of the 1967 Maple Leaf Stanley Cup champions. He was a member of the 1972 Canada Cup series that showed that hockey is really Canada's game. So I'd like to call up Ron Ellis to help me with the presentation to the first panel. Ronnie, come up for a second. Ronnie, I, I know you're not a lawyer, and I know you're not a doctor, but I also know you're a champion. Can you just tell me a, a few quick thoughts of what you thought of today's presentation so far? I'd be happy to. But Go ahead. Let's pick, pick it up, okay? Hey, first of all, uh, good morning, everyone, and it's a real uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, it's kind of humble that uh, Charles would select uh, our team in '67 uh, to provide a, a gift to our wonderful panel, and I'm here as sort of a representative of that team. But what, it's just amazing. 
uh, to me, it's reinforced to me this morning, just that, you know, the thread of, uh, the common thread of sport, and what a powerful teacher it can be. The 67 event was certainly a life-changing event for me. <coughs> but folks, uh, during that journey, I'm just trying to make some comparisons here. During that journey, there were a lot of twists and turns that particular year, a lot of turmoil. Um, the start of the season, we had some of our best players uh, hadn't signed contracts, so there was a lot of dissension and tur uh, turmoil on the team. And during the season, some of our top players uh, became injured and weren't able to play at their top capacity. And then we had a stretch where we lost 10 games in a row. And people said, this team will never win anything. And what happened after that loss of 10 games in a row, about two thirds of the way through the season, we as a team got into the dressing room after practice and spoke our minds. And it got heated at times. The goalie would say, clear the guys out of the front of the net so I can see the puck, you know. Defense would say, you forwards, I have to come back and help out a little more. And the forwards would say, you got to get the puck up to us so we don't have to play on our end the whole night. <laughs> like the Leafs did most of this year. <laughs> you know? So there was a, just a lot of discussion. And, and uh, finally, our captain, our assistant captains took the information that we finally said this is what we think will help us recover and turn things around. Took, took it to the coaching staff, and the coaching staff then would make a decision on what they're going to implement uh, in the game plans. And eventually, we get to the, an opportunity to participate in the playoffs, and through all that turmoil and a little bit of uh, you know, win one, lose one, we ended up with uh, an ultimate victory. And, uh, and it wasn't an easy one. First game, uh, the Canadians blew us out 6-2. Wow. But we rebounded, and new decisions were made. Second game, we win 3-0. And uh, but we didn't, it wasn't a, an easy task. And I just want to congratulate all the panel members that are taking part today, and congratulate all of you in the audience that actually are involved in these life decision-making events. And uh, I know I've learned something today. My father just turned 91. My mo mother-in-law just turned 90. Uh, our family has some decisions to make. Thank you very much. Okay. of these since they were eight years old. This is my first. <laughs> Thank you. 